Welcome to Insights. I'm Dick Goldberg, and our subject today, smoking cessation. How do you quit smoking? This subject is uh, pretty overwhelming because, believe it or not, 443,000 Americans die every year from smoking-related illness. And for each one who dies, there's 20 other Americans who suffer with at least one serious tobacco-related illness. With us to discuss this subject, Dr. Eric Heiligenstein. He is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin. He's also medical director of the Wisconsin Nicotine Treatment Intervention Project. Last month, he was honored to be selected to present to the Interagency Committee on Smoking and Health, chaired by the Surgeon General, Regina Benjamin. Eric, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Eric, you know, it's so obvious. Everyone's got to know how terrible cigarettes are for you. Why do people keep doing it? Well, cigarettes are highly addictive. Nicotine is one of the most addictive drugs uh, on the planet. And what is it about nicotine that uh, makes it so addictive? Well, there are lots of factors. Uh, cigarettes are highly engineered drug delivery systems. The tobacco companies make them that way. So you mean you get high, you smoke it, you get high, you got to have more? Or what, what is it that... Well, nicotine delivered through cigarettes go to the brain very quickly. What does that do for you when it goes to the brain? Uh, nicotine binds to very specific receptors in our brain, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Wow. Okay. Yeah. We know you know what you're talking about. <laughs> what does that do to you? What that does, it does what any other drug of abuse does in our brain. It stimulates the reward pathways. Oh, really? But nicotine, like any other drug, does that very well and probably does it better than any other drug of abuse. Okay, I, I'm, I have some expertise because I smoked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to remember when I, when I would take a drag, it would mm -hmm. feel good, mm -hmm. but I didn't feel high. No, but the reward pathway with nicotine as it is with any drug is a reward or reinforcing okay. type of um, uh, effect. Okay. So there is some euphoria or some positive effects that come yes. with it. Many smokers describe a mild euphoria or antidepressant effects or increasing alertness. And that positive reinforcement comes very quickly with cigarettes because it's inhaled and enters the bloodstream and nicotine hits the reward pathways within about 10 seconds. Wow. And is metabolized very quickly mm -hmm. and is gone within about two hours. So it's a perfect drug of addiction. In quickly, out quickly, and then one gets cravings and withdrawal. Well, two hours would mean you'd smoke about 10 cigarettes a day at most, six maybe? Exactly. And so that's why what do people smoke do. so much? Six, they, what about these two-pack-a-day smokers? Those are people probably who, one, have very high metabolism of nicotine, and also the more you smoke, the more your body wants nicotine. Your body oh. says, I want more nicotine. You have oh. to listen so you to you keep your raising your threshold to you smoke exactly, all the time. Over time. Um, how many Americans, what percentage of our country is addicted to cigarettes? Uh, most recently, the statistics were about 17.9%, one of the lowest ever. We started out about 1965 before the Surgeon General said smoking causes cancer. We were about 45% of Americans smoked, so there's been staggering progress. Well, wow. and has that keeps going down in a straight line, or is it leveled off? Or? It has leveled off since about 2004. Oh. Okay, so that's a little discouraging, isn't it? It has been discouraging, but it's also started some very important work in looking at who the smokers are and why that's leveled off. Well, that's interesting. Do you know? Uh, what we found out is that many people have been left behind over in the past 50 years, that there's been very discreet and what we call a disparate group of smokers who have not really benefited from all the public health interventions over the past 50 years. Well, what is it about them that they're not benefiting? Um, they're very vulnerable individuals in our society, very oh. discreet and distinct groups. By vulnerable, you mean psychologically vulnerable or...? Well, the groups are ethnic minorities who smoke at higher rates, hmm. less educated, lower socioeconomic status, I see. youth, and the biggest group are individuals with mental health and addictive disorders. Oh, okay. All so these groups have been left behind, and their smoking oh. rates have not dropped as precipitously as, quote, the general population. Unquote. Oh, okay. So that's interesting. So the highly educated, highly educated, non-minority, non-minority, non-poor, non-poor smoking rates have plummeted to that's something. single digits. Wow. Right. Now, at the University of Wisconsin, where you do a lot of your work, mm -hmm. you see a lot of people who. I assume fit into this majority population you're talking about that who have plummeted mm -hmm. uh, among university students. Are you seeing the same kind of plummeting rate that 
you should see? Uh, Young adults tend to have higher smoking rates than the general population, though. They're being targeted by the cigarette companies now because they can no longer market to, to children. Now, wait a, minute, Eric, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't want to get mm -hmm. sued. Mm -hmm. How do you know? I mean, when they put an ad on, can, mm -hmm. can you back that up, or is that just your assumption? Because that's a vulnerable market. They're marketing to students when they... Uh, oh, no, it's quite clear. Their marketing dollars now are to 18, 25 years old. Oh, really? Yes. With things like football games or something? Or? Uh, bars, bar marketing. That's where most of their money goes right now. Wow. College marketing efforts. Oh, I bet they'd have a rebuttal to you if they were here. but No, not. it's it's public information. Okay, okay, and it's working, huh? It's, it's working very well. The highest rate of smoking initiation now is after 18 years of age, in the sense of that market segment now has become where people, uh, you know, that, that market segment, the 18 to 25-year-old, is now where smokers tend to be versus where it used to be in the Joe Camel area. Uh, Joe Camel era yeah. is where that was the target population where they tried to generate the most smokers. Mm -hmm. Youth and Youth is still a vulnerable a group, but not as vulnerable as it used to be where there was the, the Joe Camel marketing, where there was much easier for youth to buy cigarettes. There's been tremendous public health efforts at cracking down on selling cigarettes to minors, cartoonish marketing. Now it's shifted to 18 to 25, and that's where you're finding a much more vulnerable okay. population. Okay, so if tobacco companies are totally maximizing their profits and their smokers. Mm -hmm. This is the best market for them to target if yes, they want to hook people into cigarettes and yep. keep their income stream plus going. Inter plus international markets. That's yeah. a whole other story. Yes. <laughs> How about price? Uh, I, I think I yep. heard about that affects teenage behavior or yes, it college does. behavior. It does too. Yeah, Tobacco taxes you know, can drive down smoking rates. Unfortunately, the groups we talked about are less responsive to um, some of the public health initiatives we talked about, particularly tobacco taxation. Um, they tend not to be as affected, and their smoking rates tend not to drive, be driven down as effectively by taxation okay, because well, they tend to be more heavily nicotine dependent. So they usually change their smoking behaviors rather than saying, I can't afford this, I'm going to cut down. They tend not to have as much resources that you and I might just think naturally about, well, boy, they're raising my cigarette taxes. Yeah. I'm going to go to my doctor and quit smoking. Someone who might be poor. Uh, might have a psychological disorder, might not have that kind of resource or capacity to think that way. So they eat less and keep smoking? They may do something like that, or they may, wow. um, you know, smoke in a different way, inhale longer, you know, change their pattern of smoking. But the high school students, mm -hmm. I, I understand they're not being as exposed to it, but right. those who might start when they're 16 or so, does price affect them a lot? Yes, it does. Okay, yeah. so that's some benefit we get. Yes, it is. Why do you think um, the minority population and poor people um, tend to be so stuck compared to the educated? Mm -hmm. uh, I can only hypothesize, you know, one is marketing. They're targeted by the cigarette companies mm -hmm. because they are vulnerable. Um, there's very clear marketing campaigns to ethnic minorities specifically targeting them. Wow. Um, you know, they're, they're very... Mm -hmm. extensive topic that I don't think we want to My, get into right. now about menthol and cigarettes being targeted particularly to African Americans. Um, but th that is one reason and uh, their particular low, less educated individuals are much more susceptible to right. marketing. What, what about the, this might be going out on a limb, mm -hmm. but if you're poor, mm -hmm. you're more likely to be not very happy. I mean, certainly studies on happiness and money show once you reach middle class, a lot of money doesn't help you, but mm -hmm. being poor makes you unhappy. Mm -hmm. Is there a relationship between depression and sadness and smoking? Uh, yes, there is. I mean, people with depression, about 50% of people with depression smoke. So there is a relation. How that relationship is is unclear, whether it, which way the arrow goes, cause and effect. So that, it's yeah. unsure if it's a shared genetic vulnerability, if you're smoked and, you're, and therefore you get depressed, or if you're depressed and therefore you're smoked, but it's, it it's, it's really is unclear. Yeah, but... If, if you're not doing well in life, you're more vulnerable. You're more to vulnerable to, to smoke. Now, and there's a lot of other things that go into that, too, because, uh, you know, less people being less well off is associated with a lot of other things, such as substance use, which yeah. is associated with smoking as well. So if you're a drug addict, you're more likely to smoke cigarettes? Uh, two to three times greater than the general population. And the different drugs, I don't know if you know this, but mm -hmm. say if you're an alcoholic or drink a lot, trouble drinker, mm -hmm. versus 
you're addicted to cocaine or heroin. Are they similar numbers of people who smoke? Pretty high. Alcoholic smokers have one of the highest smoking rates of all. They smoke about 85% compared to the general population. Methadone, about 95%. Smoke? Smoke. Wow. Yeah, so it's staggering high rates. Okay, so you're an alcoholic who mm -hmm. smokes cigarettes two packs a day. Mm -hmm. Which is the harder habit to quit? Nicotine. Most alcoholics die from tobacco-related disease. They no. don't die from alcoholism. No. Yes. Why is it so much harder? Well, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, some are sy system issues. Some are, again, what we talked about. Some of the system issues is that tobacco has been accepted within the substance abuse treatment system, so it's not ever treated. So many alcoholics will spend their whole life going to AA meetings and substance abuse treatment, and their nicotine dependence will never be addressed. So that's one reason it's very hard to quit, because they'll say, sure, you can smoke, no problem at all, but let's, you can't have a drink. Wow. Well, let me, let's say you have a friend who's 42, mm -hmm. addicted to both. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, what do you root for him or help, try to push him to quitting first, cigarettes or both. alcohol? The standard of care now is switching that you do both at the same time because for that person, the likelihood of them being successful and staying off of alcohol is better if they quit both. Why? Uh, cigarettes are, are a relapse trigger for alcoholics. Studies are showing that if someone quits tobacco at the same time they quit alcohol, their chances of staying sober longer is greater. That's interesting. So mm -hmm. something about the cigarette triggers a desire for a drink? Yes, it does. And does drink does trigger that desire for cigarettes? Yes. So when we, anybody, ah. we counsel on quitting tobacco, we recommend you stay away from alcohol no matter if they're a problem drinker or not. Well, I, I think it's time to get to work then. Yeah. What is the success rate on quitting cigarettes? If, if you quit on your own, the success rate is about 4%. So Four? One in 25 people succeed when they quit on their own? When on, on their own. Can you explain why? It's a very, very, as we talked about, a very difficult addiction. And quitting on your own, most people relapse very quickly. What, yeah. what are the hooks that cause them to relapse? Well, as we talked about, when you smoke, you smoke many times during the day. And every time you smoke, that's associated with multiple, multiple behavioral cues. Mm -hmm. So even if someone can literally push through some of the physiological parts of nicotine dependence, the withdrawal and the cravings, there are hundreds of times each day that their smoking pattern is associated with a behavioral and social cue. I smoke when I'm in the car. I smoke after I get in an argument with my wife. Uh -huh. I smoke when I'm stressed at work. I smoke when I go to my mom's house. I buried my dad and I had a cigarette. Hundreds and hundreds of times every day, every week, every year. And just because I got over my nicotine withdrawal in a week doesn't get rid of all of that. So it sounds like it's a link a lot with stress. To, it's a it's stress linked, reducer? It's linked with everything. Yeah. And so quitting is a very complex process beyond the physiological part of it because one has to learn how to fill and change all those linked behaviors. I'm pretty good at math, and what I'm hearing is about 55 million Americans are addicted to cigarettes. Mm -hmm. what, how many of those want to quit? On any given day, the research says about 75% want to quit. So there's about 40 million people who want to quit yep. and aren't succeeding. Right. Okay, so they're failing for the reasons you explained, and also I suspect the implication is they're not getting the right techniques, treatment, and support. That's Aaron? because most people try on their own. Okay. With assistance, quit rates go up to 20% at minimum. That's a huge difference. Huge difference. That's why it's incredibly important to use counseling and medication to quit. Okay, so let's say you talk to your internal medicine doc. Mm -hmm. How are you, he says, and fine. I, did you quit smoking yet? Is this in a point where there's something important that can happen with the, at the hands of that internal medicine doc? Hopefully they'd ask it in a different way. Uh, okay. How <laughs> would they ask it? They would say, you know, it's in your best interest to quit and I can help you. Ah. Okay. How, doc? Well, again... I want to quit and it never works. Yeah. And one, you would ask, you know, how have you done it in the past? And most people would say, I did it on my own, and that's why it never works. And that's the important uh -huh. concept. You know, when you ask a lot of smokers, they'll say, I quit on my own. And what gets lost in that argument is most people, when they say they quit on their own, attempted hundreds of times mm. <laughs> to do that. Quitters that use counseling and medication have a much higher success rate, and that's what gets lost in that. And that's okay. what's so important, to, to, as I would say, as that internal medicine doctor, when you use counseling and medication, your chance of being successful quicker is much better versus trying on your own and failing multiple, yes. multiple times. Okay, so you're talking to the internal medicine doc. Yep. Can she 
serve you without any other help? Can she mm -hmm. increase your likelihood without, yep. a, without a therapist? Absolutely. Okay. There's an internal medicine physician, family doctor, psychiatrist, whoever you're seeing can prescribe medications for treating your nicotine withdrawal and reducing your cravings. There's the Wisconsin Tobacco Quit Line, which is a free service that's How about available. people listening in, in England to what you're saying or anywhere? I don't know in England about that, but in, in the United States, 1-800-QUIT-NOW quit is now. the national quit line, which will then route them to their state's quit line. All the states have a quit line, and that okay. routes them to their dedicated state quit line. Is this for when you already are starting your quitting, or you want to start? Any place in, in the process, they'll work with you. They have trained uh, specialists, tobacco treatment specialists. They will answer the phone and develop any type of quit plan that works for you. Okay. It's an incredible service. Their quit rates through the quit line are, I last in Wisconsin was about 28 percent. And that's great. That's more. That's means that 72 percent fail. Well, considering that's above what the national you know research shows for most quit, it's above what you get. It's, yeah, it's fabulous. Well, certainly way above four percent. Way above four percent. Uh, before fabulous. we go any further, let's compare this to other drug addictions. Mm -hmm. With treatment, how many people successfully? Um, kick alcohol with all the intervention compared to quitting cigarettes. Do you have any idea? Or other drugs? I, I don't have those kind of national statistics or something like that, I'm afraid. Okay. All I know is the quit rates for nicotine dependence are lower than Even the for other alcohol? Ones. Yes, but no. I, I well, don't have okay, that that's specifically. What I'm after. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so where do you begin? Like, seeing mm -hmm. someone, they've been smoking for 20 years, they're mm -hmm. 42 years old, mm -hmm. here their doc. What are, you, what are you going to do, or what should a doctor do for them to help them quit? Well, again, the first thing is to find out how motivated they are and where they oh. are in the sense of their willingness to quit. Okay. And they, they say, let's play this out. Yeah, I want to quit. Of course I want to quit. Mm -hmm. What else do you need to know? When do you want to quit? You know, where? Oh, next week. That's where most smokers are. Is I mean, it? Most smokers want to quit, period. Uh-huh. The difficult thing is when. Why is that so hard? Um... It's, 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 most smokers have tried and failed, and it's, it's developing enough self-efficacy or self-confidence to say, I want to do it again. Okay. So and what do you, you want to hear? Now, today, when you ask them when you want to quit, and that gives you a I sense? mean, that's the best, because then you can get into an action phase and say, let's develop a plan how to do that. But again, most smokers, because it's been so difficult, they know the challenges, they know how hard it is, are rarely there. Um, oh, is it partly they really don't want to give it up? They want a few more cigarettes before they give it up? No, I think it's more of just because they know how hard it is, and okay. it failed, and dealing with that failure in front of their I friends see. and family is hard. Okay. So if they say in a few days, what mm -hmm. do you say? Uh, then you start working on a plan how to work up to that. You know, okay. How to follow up, what you need to do, how you want to do it. I mean, there's a lot of ways to, to manage that in the sense okay. of do we... Do I give you a prescription that you're going to start then, or do you come back and then we develop, you know, the treatment plan at okay. that date? Now, Doc, I want to start getting working on this yeah. now. So what do you do? What are the... Well, it depends on what I have in my practice. If I have a tobacco treatment specialist in my practice, I would refer that person, you know, okay. to, the, to the... Okay, we just did. Now you're the tobacco treatment, treatment specialist. specialist. Yeah. Then I would work with that person developing a, a, a quit plan. Okay. And what yeah. might be in that quit plan? Well, the quit plan would, you know cover a lot of what we talked about, the other things that go into smoking beyond just the physiological aspects of addiction, okay. in the sense of how you rearrange your life. You know, is your family supportive? Okay. One of the key aspects of smoking, are you going to go back into a family where everyone smokes and you're trying to quit, which, you know, tough. Yeah, means very your tough. chances of success are going to be very, very low. Oh, okay. So you work on all those things with the tobacco treatment specialist from your environment to your work to how you manage your cravings, how you manage your withdrawal, how you change your life without cigarettes. What are you going to do when you okay. want a cigarette? Well, he said, Doc, the hardest thing is right after dinner. I mm -hmm. have to have a cigarette after dinner. Mm -hmm. And that's what you work on with a tobacco treatment specialist is how do we develop new habits, new, new replacement strategies to cope with what you did. You, how do you fill those voids that you used to have a cigarette? Do you mm -hmm. have a piece of candy? Do you go for a walk? Do you do this? Do you do that? Figuring out different ways to change the your life, yeah, to replace those triggers, so you don't reach for a cigarette. Is that when you take nicotine replacement gum? Okay. You know, do you do, use a pharmacological intervention, or do you do a behavioral intervention? That's what you work on a tobacco treatment specialist with, or do you use the quit line and work with them 
over the telephone. Is, or is that like website. you, you call and say, I need a cigarette so bad, talk to me, kind yep. of? Just like you picture an alcoholic you, doing, calling his buddy. And, yes, you can do that with the quit line, too. And you say, I need a cigarette so bad, and they say? They would work with you and working through the craving, yeah. you know, and the urges, because urges go away. That's an important point, isn't it? Right. It's like the waves. They build, they build, they build, and then they go away. Well, that's away. interesting. So after dinner, you crave that cigarette. Mm -hmm. If you wait long enough, the craving will go away? Yep. Yeah. If, you know, there's one way to do it behaviorally or, you know, other times, as I said, some people can use nicotine replacement therapy like gum or a lozenge to reduce that craving. Okay. So what about patches? Mm -hmm. Shots, other types of intervention. Uh, nicotine patches, people can wear those to maintain a fairly constant blood nicotine level. They work pretty good to minimize withdrawal and over time can help reduce uh, cravings. Some of the spikes, like you're talking about, you know, oh my God, after dinner, I, you know, yeah. they tend not to work so well for that. And, and some of the mm. shorter acting nicotine replacement therapies like gum and lozenges work better. So sometimes you can combine the two. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the doctor, back in that doctor's office, you know, we can work together to, to put those two treatments together and tailor that to your needs to make sure you have those kind of things covered. Okay, so if, if let's say, uh, a man wants to quit smoking, mm -hmm. he is married, his wife is supportive of his quitting, mm -hmm. how can she help him to ensure this process or make it more likely it'll be successful? Um, well, since she doesn't smoke is one of the biggest right. things. Yeah. You know, helping uh, make sure that the environment is supportive in the sense of getting rid of the tobacco products, helping him fill those gaps, mm -hmm. you know, working with him in the sense behaviorally, doing things with him, yeah. really just be there during that time. Yeah, okay. So listening to him complaining about, I want a cigarette so bad, and I then, know, honey. And then figuring out what to do with that. Yeah. Since, okay, let's go for a walk. Being supportive. Know. Yeah. Okay, let me throw out a plan. Now, sure. now I'm educated. The mm -hmm. best plan sounds like you talk to your smoking specialist, be it a doctor, a therapist, mm -hmm. whatever. You figure out your cues. Then you get patches, so your nicotine... Nicotine replacement therapies are very helpful. And you get nicotine gum. It's a nicotine replacement therapy. And you have good partners or friends who support you. Right. And if you need, there are also other, other prescription medicines like Cyban or Bupropion. And what do they do? Those, uh, those are very specific medications for people who may need more pharmacological treatments, you know, more intensive treatments. Why, why would they need more? Uh, people that are much more heavily nicotine dependent, and uh, you know, like that's the two drugs, you know, Zyban and mm -hmm. Chantix, Renaclin. So those are people who may not have success with nicotine replacement therapies, you know, or have more complicated smoking histories or have failed other treatments, those can be available too. And are they like a massive dose of nicotine that goes in your system? Or no, those aren't, direct, those aren't nicotine drugs themselves. They're drugs that work in different mechanisms to help smokers with cravings and withdrawal. Oh, makes them more psychologically mellow or? No, um, the, the drugs, uh, it's a little bit more detail than you might want, but the drugs yeah. themselves can reduce cravings, oh, okay. which is important over time for some smokers. Know. Yeah. And both drugs reduce the rewards that people get from cigarettes so they can extinguish smoking behaviors very quickly. So a lot of smokers describe that they tried to smoke on the drug and, you know, after two or three puffs, threw away their cigarette. Wow. That's very helpful. Why, why doesn't everybody do that, take that kind of drug? Uh, a lot of smokers don't need to be on that intensive pharmacological therapy. You okay. know, drugs look, involve risks. And so oh, you... Okay. you Balance risk but so does smoking, Eric. I mean, right. my gosh, you're mm -hmm. going to die from smoking or be real sick at some right. time, probably. So, why wouldn't everybody say, okay, this risk is sm so small compared to how I'm killing myself slowly on cigarettes? Why not do that? Why not just give it everything and get it done? Because a lot of smokers can be successful without without such extreme measures. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and this is just an opinion I'm asking. Mm -hmm. It's not science. Do you think the government is doing as good a job as they could to reduce smoking in America? I think we're doing a good job. I think there's some misguided political decisions with some of the things that are being done. A lot of, particularly in Wisconsin, you know, we're collecting millions of dollars of tobacco tax revenues, but none of that is going to tobacco, to tobacco control right. prevention. Okay. And so the government is doing a lot, but there's some very misguided decisions that could... Uh, I think could improve what we're doing. Okay. Well, this is stepping a little out of your area, yeah. but what could the government do if, if maximum resources, maximum mm -hmm. good intention, what else could they do that would really affect this? Well, if the tobacco tax monies were directly put into tobacco control, one... What do you, what do you mean by control? Well, 
you know, we're collecting millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars through tobacco taxes right. every year. You know, none of that is going into oh, better, just, helping smokers quit. It's going into just general revenue. It's going coffers, into general revenue. Just a source of revenue. Exactly. Oh, okay. If that was going into helping smokers quit, one thing we would do is we would use a, a substantial portion of that money to give people free nicotine replacement therapies. Okay. Right now, they only get two weeks when they call the quit line. Oh, really? We would love to fund that for a much longer duration. Plus, we would love to fund nicotine replacement therapy at all clinics throughout the state. In the country? Well, in the country, too. You'd like too. to see that happen. You'd love to see that. So yeah. that if someone says, comes to their doctor and said, I want to quit, they say, great, here's, here's six weeks of nicotine replacement therapy free. And right now, do, throughout the nation, do most health care policies not pay for all that? Or? Some pay for it, but there's a lot of people who can't afford it. It's over the counter. Some insurance companies don't always cover it. So there are gaps. Okay. We, well, so if you were the president, mm -hmm. you, you'd want to see legislation that says all health insurance have to, has to pay for smoking cessation. You would like to see that. Isn't that good economics for everybody? It would be great economics. I mean, my gosh, what's it cost when one person dies from oh. cancer? You know, there's just numerous studies that show every dollar spent on tobacco control saves 5 to $6 in health care costs. So. Wow. Well, but, now, let's go to the old-fashioned way. Yeah. Let's go back. This is a long time ago, and I quit. Mm -hmm. And not to brag, but I did it without any of these supports. I just right. did it myself. Mm -hmm. and How many my, times did you try I uh, probably 12. Okay. So with yeah, treatment, was, you might have only had to try once. That's true. That would be better. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I did was I said, okay, if I, I used to get hooked by saying, I'll just have one cigarette. Right. And then down the slippery slope I'd go. As soon as yes. I had one, I'm done. So I finally realized you can't light up. Once you quit, if the minute you light up one, take one drag, you're losing. And that's I, I used the cold turkey approach, and it did work mm -hmm. with that were moments of tremendous craving. Mm -hmm. If people knew this, if they said to themselves, one drag and I've failed, mm -hmm. would that help the person quit? Did I come up with an ingenious method here? I say to yourself, understand. Say to yourself when you quit. You quit on when your own. You say, I'm quit. done with cigarettes. Okay. And you say, if I have one drag, mm -hmm. just saying, I'm just going to have a cigarette. I'm still quitting, but I'm just going to have a cigarette mm -hmm. or a drag. You have failed. You can't, just like with alcohol, you can't oh, have that's, one drag. That's, people do that as part of a quit plan. They no, do. No one. You say to people when they quit, you should not have any tobacco at all. Period. Okay. So, but the people who do it on their own don't have a counselor like you to tell them. No. No. So, those who aren't going to get help, I guess, and are listening, should it, know that. They should. Well, they, they should absolutely. But know you're the expert, you, so you're telling them that. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. When you quit, you have to quit. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and let me ask you this: the resources. Mm -hmm. Uh, as we close here, mm -hmm. that people can turn to if they want to quit or they want to encourage someone near them to mm -hmm. quit. Why don't you list for us or whatever, what are the important resources they should know before we Again, in, you know, in Wisconsin, the 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Yeah, okay, and in California well, or anywhere. 1-800-QUIT-NOW is a national number. Okay, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. And you call there? You call there and you'll be routed to your state tobacco quit line. Okay. So that's a free resource for anyone. And how about medical resources wherever you live? Uh, what should you do besides calling that, or what can you do to help this process? You start with your primary care physician. Okay. Tell them you want to quit. Tell them you want to quit. Okay. Eric Heiligenstein, thanks very much for being with us. And no I hope problem. You'll, I appreciate it. You bet. And I hope you'll join us on the next edition of Insights.